I'll, I'll, I think I'll just start reading and then I'll, I'll talk afterwards if anybody wants to hear me talk about anything. So um, I'm going to read from chapter two of Ghost um, because it's fairly near the beginning of the book and I feel as though it doesn't have any spoilers and it sets the scene quite well for the rest of the book. I used to dream of someone from the outside coming to Langlands. I dreamed of a friend before I even knew what that was. I didn't lack company. Grandmother was always there, except on the rare occasions when she went into the nearby town for things we couldn't make or grow or find for ourselves at Langlands. She was never too busy to talk to me. In fact, sometimes I had the feeling she pushed herself to do it, to amuse me or to tell me things she considered educational. She told me about the assassination of Julius Caesar while kneading bread dough so forcefully that it might have been the assassin's head she was pummeling. Another time I remember listening to her describing the life of Mary Queen of Scots while we pulled up carrots and potatoes from the earth, shaking them to loosen the clinging soil. It wasn't as though I was always alone or never heard the sound of another voice. I simply felt that there could have been something else. The idea was somehow shapeless. I couldn't think how or why things would be different with a friend to the way they were with grandmother. They just would be. I would daydream about someone being there with me, someone my own age. Sometimes when I had no chores to do and was free to roam around the house and grounds, I would imagine that this someone was with me, keeping step, but a little way behind, so they were just invisible, even out of the corner of my eye. It was understood that I was too polite to turn around suddenly to catch them unawares. Since we never entertained, I had no idea how it was supposed to amuse a guest, so I would show them Langlands as a way of showing them my life. Langlands was a fortress and a labyrinth and a treasure chamber all rolled into one. There were bedrooms and sitting rooms, dressing rooms and storerooms and funny little circular rooms in the turrets that were no use for anything because you couldn't put furniture against the walls. It had a grand main staircase with newel posts carved into stylized thistles that looked more like fat artichokes and other hidden staircases once used by servants. There were servants' passages too, so that the long vanished staff of Langland's house could move about discreetly. I wondered whether their footsteps had been audible. I thought so, because in every part of the house the ancient floorboards creaked and groaned under passing feet. It must have been strange, I thought, to hear the sound of someone pattering from one end of the house to another without being able to see them. Perhaps that was how Langlands had acquired its reputation for being haunted. Some of the rooms were not in a state to be used. They were full of lumber or empty or closed up completely. Two of us could hardly use so many rooms after all, let alone heat them all properly. We had a bedroom each, furnished with some of the best things in the house, although the rooms themselves had been selected on the basis of which held the best beds, since it was completely impossible for the two of us to move anything so heavy by ourselves. A long time ago, back in a time my memory could not reach, I shared grandmother's room, but as soon as I was old enough to have my own, I'd moved to my current one at the other end of the passage because I liked the iron bedstead and the green velvet curtains. In addition to our own rooms, there was a library containing thousands of volumes and we had a piano which grandmother played beautifully and I less so. There were other fascinating things all over the house, paintings and portraits and stuffed creatures and exotic souvenirs brought from overseas by adventurous ancestors. It was easy to lose an afternoon sorting through strange seashells or faded postcards or coins worn smooth by age. There was even a little stone mausoleum hidden away in a tangle of overgrown bushes in the woods where former inhabitants of Langland's house had been laid to rest centuries before. The path that had once led to it was almost entirely overgrown. Grandmother discouraged me from going there out of respect for the dead, but sometimes when I strayed close to it, I would glimpse the grey walls disfigured with growths of lichen. It had never bothered me, solitary child that I was, to have the long dead nearby. There was something almost reassuring about it. If I had no wider family circle than grandmother, 
at least I had these historical forebears. I'm making it sound like a museum, but Langlands was a working house, even if we couldn't keep up every part of it with only two of us to do the work. We had nearly everything we needed. There was plenty of firewood for the winter and we grew a lot of our own food. We had a vegetable garden, chickens and aromatic herbs in pots. There was a water pump in the kitchen. It took a fair amount of effort to keep things running, to tend the vegetables, to bring in the wood, to draw and heat water for a bath. I preferred the work to studying though. As well as mathematics and botany, grandmother made me learn Greek and Latin, but I could never see the point of those. It wasn't as though I even had anyone to talk to in English, apart from her. If outsiders ever came to Langlands, I always had to hide. And that is my very first memory, hiding. I don't remember who came to the house or why. I remember someone knocking at the front door, the blows brisk and loud on the weathered oak panels. I remember toiling up the wooden staircase to the first floor, holding up my skirts in my fists. At the turn of the stairs, I looked down at the hallway below with its black and white checkered tiles and saw my grandmother staring back at me, her brows drawn together and her jaw thrust forward, her eyes blazing an urgent message. She gestured at me abruptly. Go! She couldn't shout it. The person outside would have heard. I reached the top of the stairs before I heard the bolts being drawn back on the oak door. In a corner of the upstairs landing, there was a stuffed bear standing on his hind legs, his jaws frozen in an eternal snarl. I was not afraid of him. His savage expression was belied by the moth-eaten patches in his fur and the bluntness of his claws. I squeezed into the space between his hairy back and the panelled wall and crouched down, hugging my knees. I waited, breathing in the dusty scent of fur. I don't know how long I hid there, nor what my grandmother said when she came to find me. What I remember is just that, having to hide myself. You don't question things like that when you were really tiny, but later I did. Why did I have to hide? Why couldn't I leave the estate? Where was my mother, grandmother's daughter, of whom she spoke so seldom and so sadly? And eventually, who was my father, of whom she never spoke at all? And what had become of him? The answer was always the same, the war. Far away on the other side of the dark forest that surrounded Langland's house, war was raging. Aeroplanes flew in formation across the night sky, showering the cities below with incendiary bombs. Great metal machines with caterpillar treads instead of tyres rumbled through the ruins of towns, crushing everything in their path. Even the oceans were infested with deadly submarines that cruised back and forth, stalking the ships. Those who were not called up to fight had to work for the war effort. Grandmother was too old, she said, but I was not. If I were discovered, we would be separated. You'd be taken away. I remember her saying that to me, perhaps for the first time, perhaps for the tenth. She held me by the shoulder, shaking me a little, and her grip hurt. It was too tight. I wanted to pull away. A strand of white hair had shaken loose from the knot at the back of her head and hung down over her face. She looked a little wild. You'd never come back. Do you understand? I did understand. She made me understand all of it. I would have to go into the city and work in a munitions factory under constant threat of bombing. No more hours passed curled on the window seat in the library with a book open on my lap. No more picking my way silently through the forest to be rewarded with a glimpse of a young deer lifting its head to look at me or a rabbit dashing away with a flash of white tail. Just endless grinding work with the stink of hot TNT in my nostrils and the constant danger of accidental explosions in addition to the threat of enemy attacks. Grandmother talked and I listened until terrible visions filled my head of girls my age whose skin and hair was dyed yellow from incessant contact with sulphur, of girls crushed flat in the bombed rubble of their apartment houses. And supposing my curiosity about the world outside Langlands was so persistent that it overcame my fears? Well, there was the guilt. Alone at Langlands, grandmother would be unable to keep things running by herself. A practical problem like being unable to chop enough firewood could make a harsh winter lethal for someone her age. 
When the war finally ended, then assuming I had survived it, I might tramp back to Langlands and find that it had become a tomb. I imagined myself walking up the track in winter, the frozen earth black under my feet, white flakes of snow drifting slowly down, finding the house dark and cold, the front door locked, no answer to my knocking. Walking around to the back door, glancing into the chicken run and seeing a few pitiful heaps of feathers lying still and silent. Seeing those tiny deaths, knowing I don't want to go inside the house because death is there too. That, that was why I had to hide and why I could never go outside the estate. It didn't mean my mind didn't want to go there. Sometimes I would go down to the very edge of the Langlands estate where the forest ended. There was a track leading away through the fields, eventually meeting a road. The road was too far away for me to see very much of what passed up and down it, but I could pick out the larger vehicles. Everything seemed to be moving about very peacefully. Now and again, I saw an aeroplane, but there never seemed to be anything sinister about that either. No dropping bombs, no distant fires. So, I said to myself, grandmother had chosen her hiding place well, and Langlands really was too remote to be affected by the war. What else could I believe in if not in her? Who else did I have in the whole world but her?